happy to have um, Phil Starks, a professor of statistics, but also the associate dean for the mathematical and physical sciences. And as a statistician, he's been very important and instrumental in the study of fairness in various domains. He studies voting theory as well as studying um, gender bias and evaluations. And he cares about changing policies. So he gathers data, and nowadays we'd say he's a data scientist, but he actually is a guide in the cloth statistician. So we're very happy to have him. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, if you saw my talk in October in the stat department, this is not going to be very different. So um, you should go to sleep or leave or, or <laughs> social media or something. But, uh, no point in paying attention. Um, the work I'm going to talk about is mostly uh, joint work with Anne Boring, who's at Erasmus University, Richard Freistadt, who's at UC Berkeley, he was uh, with the Center of Teaching and Learning, now he's with the Business School, and Kelly Otoboni, who is a graduating PhD student in statistics. If you're looking for statisticians, um, I'll let you digest this for a moment. <laughs> So um, my hope is that um, we will get a little better approximation to the truth of student evaluations um, in this talk, um, but uh, it might piss you off. This is actually quite relevant for student evaluations and a bunch of other things. Over lunch we were talking about uh, evaluating faculty for tenure and promotions and the same kind of thing applies. So, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So there are a lot of things that may be good for monitoring performance, but um, once you set things up in a way that you can game them, um, then people will. <clears throat> so uh, student evaluations are the most common method to evaluate teaching. Um, they're used for personnel decisions. Um, they have the benefit that they're simple, cheap, and fast to administer. You subcontract the evaluation of teaching to a group of students. Um, Okay, the question is, do they actually measure teaching effectiveness? Do they measure quality of teaching? What, what are they uh, actually measuring? So I'm gonna start with some um, ranting about how the numbers are calculated um, and kind of a lack of anchoring to anything before going on to talk more specifically about the substance of it. So it's typical in student evaluations to ignore the response rate. Uh, and treat the students who responded as if they were a random sample from the students who were in the class. But they're not a random sample, they're an incomplete census, and they're self-selected, and you would expect bias under these circumstances, <coughs> even if the instrument were measuring what you thought it was measuring, <clears throat> uh, the non-response is not ignorable. Um, in many things, you know, people who are um, agitated, either in a good way or a bad way, tend to respond. So, what are typical response rates at Stanford to student evaluations? Um, well, it probably depends on the course and the students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think 70% is higher. Than, yeah. 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 70 didn't used to be high, but the numbers I'm hearing these days in most places is like 30%. Yeah, 30 but there's a, there's a bias because they can only see their grades if they have... No, they they see their grades early. Oh, they only see all of this in the so that kind of incentive to, to respond has been tried in a bunch of places, and it's kind of controversial because there's some evidence that it just encourages cheap responses, just click, 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 right. done. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, one measure of whether the students are engaged in that is the extent to which they actually bother to type comments. So if people don't comment, you might imagine they haven't thought about it very much. Anyway, so um, just suppose you had 70% of students responding. This is, of course, gets to be more extreme uh, the lower the response rate. So the overall average could be anywhere between a 3.1 and a 4.9 if the average is 70% or, you know, or a 4. Um, if it were 30%, uh, you know, then you could put 70% of the mass on 1 or 70% of the mass on 7 and, and, and skew this even further. So the idea of calculating something like a margin of error doesn't mean anything um, for a sample like this because it isn't random. <clears throat> so what are these things that we are averaging, right? So first of all, Trying to draw a conclusion about a whole population from a non-random sample is not a good way to start. Um, but what are the numbers we're averaging? Are they anchored to anything? Do they, you know, what do they mean? So uh, I don't think that a three means the same thing to every student. Um, I don't think that uh, the numbers mean the same thing in different styles of courses. I think that uh, a rating in a required course for the major is going to be different from an elective course. It's going to be different from an enormous lecture course, an online course, or this or that. <clears throat> um, 
For an average to make sense, you need to be working with a scale where the intervals mean something, where the difference between a one and a two means the same thing as the difference between a five and a six. And I don't think that that's, that that's how it works. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this later. Um, uh, does a one balance a seven to make two fours, right? That's kind of what we're saying it does by taking averages. Um, and uh, by working with averages, we're ignoring variability. So here's you know, four different sets of numbers that have the same mean. But I would guess that what's going on in this classroom is really pretty different from what's going on in this classroom. Um, and you tend to get polarized responses very often um, if you're teaching controversial material. And I have examples where people were teaching something about, say, healthcare and underrepresented minorities, where you know, half the class really liked her position and half the class really didn't like her position and you end up with the halo effect where if the students don't like what you're doing they globally don't like what you're doing and it's it's different from specifically commenting on the teacher uh, this is to remind me to tell a joke um three statisticians <laughs> go deer hunting uh they spot a deer first one shoots he's a yard off to the left second one shoots she's a yard off to the right third one says we got it <laughs> um, so, on the point you make there, I mean, are you going to present data on that? Because, I mean, I've looked at a number of samples of these things, and they very highly polarize yep. in, a, in real data it, it's, so. Yeah, so I think that reporting um, bar charts uh, makes a lot more sense than reporting averages, because you can kind of see the distribution, and it keeps you from averaging things, which is just, you know, Losing information and isn't appropriate because it isn't an equal interval scale. So um, averages don't make sense for ordinal categorical scales like this, right? This is really, you know, a, a five is in some sense better than a four, but not by the same amount that a four is better than a three. They're just not anchored to anything, uh, much less to each other across students. <clears throat> um, and trying to compare different instructors, different courses, different levels of classes, and whatnot is just kind of yeah. doomed. Um, we shouldn't be ignoring very boring in our response. So just to try to broaden this slightly, um, the same issues arise in averaging these kind of Likert scales across a self-selected population um, in, other, in other contexts. So you know, reviews of physicians are notoriously like this. Like people you know, submit negative reviews for the physicians because the physician's bedside manner was bad, not because they didn't get better. Right, um, it, it's, it's kind of a, a complicated thing where your reaction to something spills over, and what does a seven mean um, anyway? Uh, online product ratings, how many stars something gets, and who's choosing to write the reviews, et cetera. Um, all right. So this is a, a word I made up, um, quantification. Um, assign a meaningless number, and then because it's quantitative, it must be meaningful, right? It's supposed to be measuring something. Um, and we see this over and over again, but in student evaluations, I claim, are, are an example. Okay, so um, this is a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. The language is dated. There are some things that are offensive by contemporary uh, political standards, but uh, I think it's still worth reading. Um, this particular quote is priceless. If you can't prove what you want to prove, demonstrate something else and pretend they're the same thing. In the days that follows the collision of statistics with the human mind, hardly anyone will notice the difference. Right? So this is going to change the subject. So um, I claim that that's what we're doing with student evaluations. It's hard to measure teaching effectiveness. So instead, we measure student opinion, and we don't measure it that well, and we pretend it's the same thing. Right. Okay. Um, a, a, an analogy I use is it's, it's as if you want to measure somebody's IQ, but all you have is a bathroom scale. So you just relabel the dial, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's called IQ, it must be IQ, right? No, okay. <clears throat> so what is effective teaching? Um, I don't know, but it ought to have something to do with facilitating learning, right? All of the things being equal, uh, a better teacher creates an environment and presents opportunities that will induce more students to spontaneously learn. Um, uh, we, can't, we can't make people learn anything. Um, grades are usually not a good proxy for learning in R1 universities for a variety of reasons. One is the same instructor who is doing the teaching is setting the exam, right? There are university systems where that isn't true. Uh, it is true here, right? Um, uh, similarly, um, uh, 
exams are not uniformly administered generally across different sections of classes. We don't randomize students into sections of classes and then randomize them into sections of follow-on classes or things like that. We're not doing the kind of manipulation that would be necessary to draw causal conclusions about the effect of teaching on, on learning. <clears throat> Um, students are generally not in a good position to judge how much they learn, especially not contemporaneously. Three or four years later, you may realize, oh, that just changed my life. I see things completely differently. But at the time, um, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to do. Um, it, you know, from my own experience, I've gone to beautiful, brilliant lectures, especially in mathematics, where I think I'm following it all. It makes perfect sense. And then you go home and try to do something with it completely lost, right? Um, so, uh, um, there are serious problems with confounding if you're trying to measure things using grades in, in general. Um, uh, among other things, you know, someone may take a particular class because the instructor has a reputation for being an easy grader, and then may take the follow-on class because that instructor has a reputation for being an easy grader. And so doing well in the first class doesn't necessarily mean that, or, or well in the second class doesn't mean you learn more or the, the previous instructor was more effective. Um, Love it, KCD. I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I've been uh, uh, pissing on scores here for a little bit, but let's uh, give comments their fair shake. Um, there are a lot of people who believe that perhaps the scores don't mean anything, but the comments are valuable. And I'm going to argue that um, it's not so straightforward as that. Um, comments on some things are, on others aren't, but even the way students and faculty use language is quite different. Carol Lauer is a, was a dean at Rollins College in Florida. When she became a dean, she started uh, to see lots and lots of personnel cases with lots and lots of student evaluations, and at some point started to really wonder whether language is being used consistently. So she, she did a, a small survey of some students and faculty there and found that they didn't mean the same thing with words like adjectives like fair, professional, organized, challenging, and respectful. So uh, if you're a faculty member, um, you might think that uh, fairness has to do with not playing favorites, being even-handed in your grading, grading solely using academic criteria, um, and things like that. At least that's what I think when I, when I think, am I being fair, right? It's, kind of, it's about level playing field for everybody. Um, uh, it turns out that um, students uh, kind of mean that, but they also mean some other stuff. Uh, so these are percentage responses. So um, students, not fair, a lot of them believe it means you know, playing, playing favorites, but grading problematic, like grading on non academic criteria, is mostly what instructors mean, whereas 25% of uh, students um, think that that means it's not fair, this work was too hard, right? You didn't help me with the homework. It's a different notion of fairness. <clears throat> okay, um, the focus of the substance here is going to be uh, talking about biases against, uh, against women um, in student evaluations, but biases against women and underrepresented minorities are kind of pervasive in, in academia um, and professional life. So there's evidence that changing the gender of the name of the applicant in a, in a, a grant application will change the success, uh, the probability of success, the rate of success. <clears throat> um, letters of recommendation, there's lots of evidence that language in letters of recommendation is highly gendered. Uh, men are more likely to be described as brilliant, women are more likely to be described as friendly, right? Or, you know, nice person or something like that. And I, I, I really do see this. Um, uh, job applications get handled differently depending on the gender of the name of the applicant, um, also depending on the ethnicity of the name of the applicant. Interruptions of job talks. This is an interesting study uh, that was done at UCSD and UC Santa Barbara. Um, <clears throat> what they did was uh, take a bunch of videos of job talks in engineering departments and uh, transcribe them and look at when the speaker was getting interrupted by the audience during the body of the talk, not the question and answer period later on, and found that women are interrupted substantially more frequently um, and with longer duration to the effect that um, uh, some number of female applicants don't even get time to finish their talk. Um, so this is, this is really an issue. We're actually replicating this at Berkeley. Um, we've gotten access to the videos of job talks in uh, engineering and a bunch of the mathematics and civil sciences departments. Um, and we've got an army of undergrads going through and annotating them. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. 
Uh, one thing I heard from one of the co-authors of this recently, uh, Pamela Cosman, gave a, a talk at Berkeley a couple weeks ago, is that there's also gender effects in introduction. So this is something to keep in mind when you're interviewing uh, candidates, that female uh, job candidates are less likely, uh, when they're introduced, it's less likely for the, the introducer to mention their accolades, their awards, um, and, and their accomplishments. It's more likely to be, you know, here's Dr. So-and-so, done. Um, and I actually saw that happen in uh, um, Pamela Cosman's talk, the way she was introduced by <laughs> <that. laughs> it, uh, it was painful. <clears throat> Uh, so, if you're interested in replicating this at Stanford, um, we're getting started, we have a little bit of experience, but one of the interesting things was getting IRB approval um, to do this because they were originally saying, well, you have to contact all the job candidates and get their permission to use these videos, even though many of them were kind of public videos. And we're like, so, first of all, most of them were rejected by Berkeley and probably aren't going to want to talk to us at this point. <laughs> but, but even setting that, that's not a reason not to seek approval, but it's like, we're actually not studying the candidate, we're studying the audience. Right? The candidate is the treatment. Um, the audience is the, is the subject, and they're largely anonymous. We don't know who's in the room. <clears throat> uh, credit for joint work. Uh, this was a study in economics that found that when women co-author with women, they get more credit for the work than if they co-author with men. It's just assumed that the, woman, that the man did the work. Um, and teaching evaluation, so I'll talk about some of this work here. So this is, this is really the focus. So um, what, <clears throat> when I say, gosh, there's a gender problem, gender biases in student evaluations, um, I get pushback of various kinds. Um, one of them, uh, I know some women who get great scores and win teaching awards. Right? Okay. <laughs> I know student evaluations aren't perfect, but they must have some connection to effectiveness. Um, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Actually, the evidence is that they, that they do, but it's negative association, not positive association. Um, but even if they did, you know, the question is, what are they measuring more of, right? What, what are, it, it, how big is the signal? Um, how big is the bias? I get better student evaluations when I feel the class went better. Uh, that's certainly true for me. But does that mean I'm measuring learning or teaching effectiveness? I mean, that, we all had a good time, right? That's a good thing. It doesn't mean I was a better teacher. Shouldn't students have a voice? Absolutely. Absolutely. We want to know how the students are feeling, what are their experience of the class. The question is, is the appropriate voice to be able to weigh in on the effectiveness of the instruction, right? Or is there, are there other things? And to what extent is their feedback useful to improve teaching, useful to inform pedagogy, but perhaps not useful to evaluate pedagogy in a way that allows comparisons across faculty, right? And that, that's really the argument, is that we want students to have a voice, we want student evaluations of some kind, we don't want them for personnel decisions. Um, it's, it's, a different, it's a different thing. So I'm um, gonna go through a number of examples. This is from uh, the Rutgers Camden uh, Law School, the dean asking male students to stop commenting on female faculty wardrobes in the student evaluations, right? Actually, the dean sent a letter to the students saying stop. Um, uh, let's see if I can make this start again. This is completely cringeworthy. Hey everybody, good morning. School may be out for summer, but that isn't stopping one professor at Cornell University from pushing a controversial policy to confront students, quote, overwhelming gender bias. And in this case, huh? Oops. Hey, joining us now to explain, campus correspondent Cabot Phillips from Campus Reform. Kevin, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks for having me on, buddy. So the idea here is that just being a woman the result of a biological accident over which you had no control ought to give you additional points in your evaluation? These are some serious allegations being made by this professor, but unfortunately for her and for her argument, there's not really facts that she's going off of. What are the allegations? The allegations are that students are naturally against uh, professors who are women, uh, whether subconsciously or they know they're doing it or not. Mm. So at the end of your course evaluations, female professors should be given an extra added automatic bonus when they're being reviewed because students are apparently uh, biased against women. She, here's what she said. Sarah Pritchard is the professor. She writes this. She said, since pervasive gender bias is not going away anytime soon, I propose one temporary solution. Female faculty should receive an automatic correction, that is to say a bonus, on their quantitative teaching evaluation scores. Such a policy would offer one concrete way to actually fix these inequalities she references being catcalled, walking across campus, 
uh, men, I guess, dressing down women, and that female professors are equal uh, in the eyes of the students. Well, she's really not getting... Okay, so um, I get all my science from Fox News. <laughs> um, the scene to me is just kind of painfully hilarious, right? We've got three guys in suits and a woman in a short red sleeveless dress, right, who, commenting on things. Um, of course, the, the, the main guy here who's coming education is wearing more makeup than she is, but that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, later on in this, she makes a comment that's actually quite perceptive, and they kind of laugh her down, right? I mean, it, this is just, anyway, um, kind of appalling. Nonetheless, I actually agree with the conclusion that we can't solve this problem by adding points to women's scores, right? And the reason for that is gender is not the only source of bias. The extent of the bias depends on the discipline, depends on the level of the class, depends on other things, and no flat addition of the same number of points across the board, even within a department, is gonna compensate it for it in a way that makes the results still meaningful. So I, I don't think that that's a good solution, um, but I really do think there's a problem. <clears throat> um, all right. Some of the other things that matter. Uh, instructor attractiveness matters. Um, one of the things that was surprising to me in this was research behind the scenes on the uh, concordance of student ratings of how attractive the faculty are. Right? It seems that, that, that it really is, uh, there's a lot of intersubjective agreement on who's hot and who's not. Um, uh, but there's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it seems to be fairly well established that um, instructor appearance matters. Here's another study, same kind of conclusions. Attractive instructors get better student ratings. <clears throat> um, this is a lovely thing. Let me see if I can get to the live version of it. Um, I, I, I have the resolution of, uh, of your monitor here. It's so awesome that I can't even see my cursor. <laughs> Okay, this is a live version. This is uh, Ben Schmidt's website, and um, what he did was to um, use uh, kind of Rate My Professors API to uh, suck live data from RateMyProfessors.com, and what he's plotting is the frequency with which um, adjectives are being used in, uh, to describe faculty in different disciplines depending on their gender. So let me see if I am actually, why am I not? Is there a problem that I've gone to? Uh, maybe I'm not gonna be able to get the live version. Am I connected to the internet? <coughs> Looks like I am. Maybe I'm not. You can see it at the top. Right? Yeah, no, it's, yeah. yeah my, my VPN's connected and they seem to be live. Can you reload the page? What's the issue? Let me try reloading the page. Yeah, I okay. can. All right, um, so this is uh, uh, orange dots are women, blue dots are men, discipline by discipline, sociology, criminal justice, math, et cetera, fine arts. Uh, women are colder than men. Right, according to, to students. Um, uh, one of my... Men are more brilliant than women, kind of uniformly across disciplines. Um, Okay. Somebody want to? <laughs> mean. Sorry? Mean. Mean. Again. 
Let's try reloading again. What's going on here? Well, um, I'm going to not waste more time on this, but it, um, it's interesting seeing how the use of language differs. <laughs> One of the things is we don't even, we don't know the gender of the students who are submitting these uh, these reviews either. Um, uh, the fact that um, oops, mean, yeah, women are meaner than men. Yeah. Um, okay. I can make this go to the other tab. Okay. Accent seems to matter. Um, there's evidence that students view non-native English speakers as linguistically incompetent to teach them. Um, so this is clearly a problem in modern universities in the United States. Um, okay, this was a really interesting study that uh, started by playing 30 second silent video clips of faculty lectures to students at the beginning of the semester and having the students rate the professor and then having the students re-rate the professor at the end of the semester. Um, the association between the ratings after 30 seconds of silent video uh, and at the end of the semester was strong and positive, um, statistically significant by some measure. Um, and even when they shortened the clips to six to 15 seconds of silent video, that didn't break the association. So how much signal is here from what actually happens during the semester and how much of this is snap judgment based essentially on appearance and manner? Um, <clears throat> uh, this was a very interesting study um, that, so, excuse me, yep. it's, it's useful to realize that the conclusion of those authors was that students can perceive how good a teacher is from only six seconds. Yeah, that's all it takes. <laughs> They're amazing. It's, 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 really, it's a wonderful measuring instrument. Yeah. Um, so um, this study had recorded lectures uh, that were recorded in an age and gender neutral voice and they were accompanied by animated stick figures. And they variously told four groups of students that this was an old man, old woman, young man, young woman speaking. Um, when they told the students that it was a young man speaking, they rated the professor higher for enthusiasm and, and other aspects of the, you know, of the lecture. Um, there is you know, some meme that if you want to, uh, if the goal is student satisfaction and we're doing these student evaluations to be able to optimize our product for, you know, for our, our, uh, our consumers, um, then the right thing to do is to hire uh, a, a attractive uh, white men who are native speakers of English um, in their late 20s and, you know, fire them before they turn 40. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I am not a fan of meta-analysis. I think that the assumptions behind meta-analysis are um, hilariously cartoonish, um, but, uh, and, and that a better approach generally to analyzing collections of studies is to look hard at the studies and how they collected their data and really think hard about it. Um, this is a meta-analysis, but as part of it, they really did go back um, uh, to the original literature and look, and they didn't just reanalyze numbers, they looked carefully at the study designs and so forth. And what they found was that the, the, the studies that were claiming that student evaluations are a good measure of, um, of, of learning, of, of teaching effectiveness, were um, largely largely small end studies. They were kind of they were they were the smallest studies. So places where you would be more likely to see a spurious a spurious positive. And then when you looked at the larger uh, multi section studies um, and tried to adjust for publication bias in some sense, um, there's there's you know no or only minimal correlation between student evaluations and learning. <clears throat> um, Obviously, the gold standard is randomized controlled experiments. Uh, the problem is it's very difficult to do them in an R1 university because we let students pick their classes. We don't randomize them into sections against their will, um, you know, typically. Uh, in the Air Force Academy, they do. So um, we have a study from the Air Force Academy uh, um, and, and a couple of others that I'll mention. Um, so this one basically found students and professors who as a group perform well in the initial mathematics course perform significantly worse in follow-on related math, science, and engineering classes. Um, and student evaluations of professors are positive predictor predictors of contemporaneous course achievement, but poor predictors of follow-on course achievement. 
So basically, the, 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 the underlying thesis here, you know, not exactly stated in this part of the paper, is students reward faculty for giving them good grades, um, and not necessarily because they've, they've learned more. <clears throat> um, this is another example of a randomized controlled study. It was performed in, uh, at Bocconi University uh, in Italy. Um, again, they randomized students into different sections of classes and follow-on classes. Effectiveness is negatively associated with students' evaluations of professors. Um, so the effectiveness here was measured by performance in follow-on classes. Um, okay, there is uh, evidence that the tenure system and its reliance on student evaluations to assess uh, teaching effectiveness leads to decreasing course content and student learning, right? That it's sort of like you, 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 you give an easier class because that's gonna get you good ratings um, and the students ultimately suffer. Um, so teaching effectiveness measured by the value added model falls uh, um, by you know, some fraction of standard deviation anyway. Um, uh, and, and faculty who are up for tenure, uh, according to this, tend to be less um, rigorous graders. This uh, is one of a number of studies that link student evaluations to grade inflation. Um, uh, there's a lovely book by Galen Johnson, a statistician from Texas A&M, if I recall correctly, uh, that basically makes a pretty compelling case that in the post-war period, when student evaluations became common, was also the time when grade inflation took off and kind of it links them together in a, in a, um, a fairly convincing way. Um, okay. Uh, grading leniency creates strong incentives for instructors to teach in ways that would result in getting good evaluations. Um, evaluations of concurrent courses, though positively correlated with concurrent grades, are negatively related to student performance in subsequent courses. So same, same general conclusion. <clears throat> um, I, I have a hard time with the statistical statements here uh, because they're relying on some models that I believe in, but, I, but you know, the, the, the overall direction and flavor of this is the same. That um, one of the arguments you hear that, that, oh, well, maybe there's a gender uh, bias in student evaluations, but it doesn't really matter because the difference in men's and women's scores is only you know, 0.3 on a seven point scale, and that's not a big number, so who cares, right? Well, if the dividing line is you gotta be above average um, in order to get tenure or in order to get reappointed as a, a, a unit uh, 18 lecturer, as a, a you know, um, a, um, yeah, lecture or other, other faculty member, um, then 0.3 can make a difference, right? I mean, that, that's getting the difference between above average and below average, and they find uh, you know, a, a fairly sizable effect. Um, so again, the use of teaching evaluations and hiring promotion decisions may put female lecturers at a disadvantage. <clears throat> um, this is a really interesting study um, where the, the author, <clears throat> who was using his own classes as an experiment, asked the students questions that actually had a correct answer. Um, for instance, um, asked them whether the homework was returned promptly. And this was done in a semester where every assignment was, refer was returned the next class meeting after it was handed in. So there was no opportunity to return it faster. Students signed that they had received their assignments and so on. Similarly, um, his grading policy was enunciated at the beginning of class in the syllabus and he gave a quiz on the grading policy, which almost everyone got 100% on and those that didn't had the opportunity to take it again until they got 100% and everyone signed a statement saying they understood what the grading policy was, okay? So those are fairly objective things. 64% um, of the students either disagreed or strongly disagreed that the instructor had explained the grading policy. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, uh, only 3% strongly agreed that the assignments were handed back in a reasonable period of time, even though every, they were all handed back in the next, very next time period. Okay, so the quality of responses here is perhaps not ideal. Um, uh, this is an interesting study that I actually learned about in my last talk here. Um, it, this is uh, done in a medical school in Germany, uh, giving chocolate cookies during discussion section. This is randomized controlled study where each 
Uh, faculty members taught two sections of a class and compared what happened with and without cookies. Um, the cookie groups evalu evaluated the teachers better and the course material better. <laughs> That's why I do it. That's why you do it. <laughs> Smart man. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, this was an interesting thing that just came out recently. It's not, it's not quite published yet. But what they found was that the differences in average SAT scores for men and women depends on how many points there are in the rating scale. And that in particular, a 10 point scale is pernicious because we all know that no women are perfect 10 teachers, whereas some men are perfect 10s, right? This is kind of the idea. That a perfect 10 is different from a six on a six point scale. Right? 10 hat carries this connotation of perfection. That's the symmetric. Right? Um, so they, they actually claim you can solve the gender bias problem by using a coarser scale. I, I don't believe that for a minute, but that's a, that's a different story. This just came out, um, and I play a role, as does Richard Freistadt, in the backstory for this. I might talk about it a little bit more. So OCUFA is the Ontario Confederation of Unions of Faculty Associations, of oh, University Faculty Associations. So this is the, 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 the union of unions um, for the province of Ontario. <clears throat> and uh, I, I testified, uh, and so did Richard, in an arbitration between um, uh, one of the university's faculty and, uh, and the university in which we prevailed and they're now, they've now stopped, uh, there's now a decision which will probably be precedent, uh, well certainly throughout the province and probably throughout Canada, uh, that, that you cannot rely on averages of student scores for um, personnel decisions. Um, uh, so that was a good thing. This report is like over 100 pages long. Here's something from the executive summary. Um, they, they call these things SQCTs. A uh, useful mechanism to gather feedback for formative purposes, but counterproductive, even harmful, uh, to evaluate the performance of faculty. Um, penalizes women, racialized and LGBTQ2S plus faculty. I don't know what the plus stands for. Does anybody? Anything else that is not covered in the lesson? Sorry? Anything else that is not covered? Anything is not covered, okay, it's, it's the, and so on. Okay, got it. Um, faculty with disabilities, these faculty are also more likely to target harassment. So they make the argument that actually having student evaluations run by the university is really kind of providing a communication channel to facilitate harassment of people based on uh, protected characteristics. <clears throat> Something we're thinking about. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the piece of the puzzle that I've actually done some research on myself, um, which is on uh, gender bias. And this was triggered uh, in part by this paper uh, by uh, McNell, uh, Driscoll, and Hunt. Um, this was a brilliant little experiment. Um, my understanding of how it came to be was that Lillian and Adam were both graduate student instructors in a methodology class. I, I want to say it was in the sociology department, um, but I, I'm not sure. And this is an online class where the students never see the instructors face to face. All the, the communication is through threaded, threaded discussion boards and so forth. And the, the midterm happened, and uh, Lillian says to Adam, how do you deal with the flood of email of students complaining about their grades and asking for regrades and all this stuff? And Adam says, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so the hypothesis was that they kind of expected that they could push Lillian around or get things from her that they wouldn't be able to get from a, from a male GSI. And so they decided, they, they talked to the instructor and arranged the next time they were going to teach this together to do a randomized controlled experiment. And what they did was to randomize students into six sections. Two were taught by the instructor of record, two taught by Adam, two taught by Lillian. But in one of the sections taught by Adam and one of the sections taught by Lillian, they swapped names. Okay, so these are both um, people, they were in the same year in the program, they both had very Anglo-Saxon names, there's not much in their CVs to distinguish them. Um, the biggest difference is, you know, the one bit of information about the gender of the name. <clears throat> um, okay, so what happened? This uh, are the different aspects of teaching that there were items on the evaluations for. This is the difference in scores between when they use the male identity minus the score when they use the female identity. So all of these numbers are positive, indicating that the male identity got higher ratings on, on, on every, uh, every axis. And that's standard deviations, right? No, it's a, it's a five-point scale, and oh. this is the average difference on a five-point scale. Um, 
So, and these are p-values from a permutation test that kind of maintains the randomization structure that was actually used to assign students. So that um, it, it treats, uh, the, the, the null hypothesis basically is that the way a student would rate the true Lillian has no connection to whether the true Lillian identified as Lillian or Adam. Um, so that, that, that we're treating exchangeability like that, and similarly for Adam, but no assumption that they would treat um, Adam's name the same every time that it shows up or something like that. <clears throat> um, so among the things that stick out here in the permutation test, promptness, fairness, and praise um, are all significant at 1%. Promptness is how quickly assignments were returned. They were returned at exactly the same time in all six sections of the class. So if, you, if your name is Lillian, you are slower than if your name is Adam. This, is, this to me is like an incredible smoking gun. Again, an objective criterion. You would expect students to be able to answer, but it's colored by something. Um, this column is what was published in the original paper. Uh, they did their um, hypothesis tests using a t-test, which is not really appropriate here. The, the assumptions aren't satisfied. Kind of interestingly, um, generally, the non-parametric approach, the, the, the permutation approach, gives on the whole smaller p-values, um, but also flags quite different things. So some of the things that are, that are coming up here would have a p-value of 19% by, by the wrong test. So there's a little object question about statistics buried in here somewhere. <clears throat> so, so this third column is, is your one? This third column is what they published. This, the, oh, sorry, th this column is what they published. This column is our work based on their data. <laughs> um, uh, to get the data was actually kind of entertaining. Um, so, so I would think this could matter about the discipline. What what discipline was this course in? I believe it was. Uh, I think it was essentially a statistics course. It was a methodology course, I believe, in sociology. Yeah. Um, uh, and then the lectures were videos, or like uh, how did? Yeah, they, I think it was videos. I think it was videoed lectures given by the, the instructor of record. Neither neither of them. So they they, they were oh, they were I both see, working I for an instructor see. for a professor. Professor gave the lectures. Professor staffed the discussion board for two of the sections, and then Adam and Stu and Lumi did. Yeah. So I would expect overall to have a lot more power than every characteristic. A lot so more power in terms of the test. Like, why did it get a p-value point twelve? Uh, other things that... Um, well, I mean, there's kind of a lot of, they, they actually, so first of all, we're using the t-statistic in our test as well. We're just calibrating it using the permutation distribution. Um, and they did, I, I, what they did didn't make a lot of sense to me. I think they, did, they didn't even really pair on the instructors. They just took male identity, female identity, rather than comparing Adam to Adam with different names and Lillian to Lillian with different names. <clears throat> um, so that, that could be part of what's going on. Um, but it's just, it's just not the right test. I mean, it's, it talks about, you know, the data need to be IID coming from Gaussian distributions um, with equal variances for the t-test to make sense. Um, and instead, what we have is highly dependent data because if you're randomized into this section, you're not randomized into that section. The sections were not that large. The rating scales are, are a five-point scale. They're not, they don't look like Gaussian you know, Gaussian data in the first place, it, there's just no reason that the t-test would give you a, a, sensible, a sensible answer. Um, I was gonna mention briefly like the, the getting of the data, but uh, oh, let, me go, let me go on, because I'm, yeah. I'm not getting to it, okay. Um, okay, so uh, what about student learning? So the same exam was administered in all six sections of the class. Students of, who thought they were learning from a male instructor did slightly better on the, uh, on the, uh, in the course overall than students who thought they were learning from a female instructor. But Lillian's actual students, so positive difference means male identity minus female, this is the actual. So this is Adam's student scores minus Lillian. So Lillian's students did better by an amount that was large and statistically significant. So objectively, she was the better instructor. Okay, but the gender bias from the instrument hides that and in fact makes it look like the, the, the male identity does better. So this, this is pretty telling. So this, this means we, we are able to control for actual teaching effectiveness. We're able to see, I mean, to the extent that you believe that the grades are a measure of learning, um, but it, it seems, uh, again, pretty, pretty compelling. So the next uh, uh, natural experiment I'll talk about is uh, data that was, um, this is in the work with Anne Boring and Kelly Odebody from 2016. Five years of data for six freshman classes at Sciences Po. Uh, students go through these classes in lockstep. They take triplets of classes together and they have the same, so with, with the same set of 
uh, students. Um, so they, they, they develop uh, you know, colleagues over that time. Um, there are 23,000 student evaluations of almost 400 instructors by more than 4,000 students, a bunch of sections. And we analyze these data uh, by discipline by year because you have a cohort of students going through together. So it doesn't make sense to compare across years and they may not be the same instructors every year. Um, uh, and then there may be differences across disciplines and we wanted to see, to, to tease that out. So we looked at them separately. The response rate is essentially 100%. Student evaluations are mandatory um, and students generally comply. All of these uh, courses had anonymous final, final exams except for political institutions. Um, and so that's actually really helpful. Um, they're multi-section classes. We're comparing instructors of different sections of the class. They're using the same syllabus, same teaching materials, same exams. Um, and uh, an interesting feature is that students get interim grades before the final. So they get their interim grades, they do the student evaluations, and then they take the final exam. Um, so they have very strong grade expectations going into uh, doing the evaluations. And the test statistics we used to look at this were basically the correlation between evaluations and something else um, within strata and then averaging those across strata. So um, this is a way to just try to you know, combine power without um, mixing strata together. <coughs> um, there are other things that we could have done. This is, this is the only thing we could have done. Okay. So what do you see? Um, if you look at the correlation between student evaluations and performance on the, on the anonymously graded final exam, um, we've got some, uh, overall, a very small positive correlation across all of the, the disciplines. History has a, a, a positive correlation that's big enough to be statistically significant. Um, this is positive, these three are negative. Okay? So we're not exactly seeing something saying Student evaluations are a good measure of performance on this anonymously graded final, right? It's, it's kind of mixed, and if you look at this, it's sort of, the reason this isn't included is because this final wasn't anonymous, right? <clears throat> so we got two positive, three negative. <clears throat> um, what if you look at the association between the evaluation scores and gender? Um, overall, microscopic p-value. Men get higher student evaluation scores, okay? Um, and uh, it's, it's positive across the board, so, um, but th this is the one that sticks out, you know, this, this sort of overall summary as highly significant. <clears throat> okay, even if you thought that this was just going to be a coin toss, you've got something like, you know, coin landing heads five times in a row, so, you know, p-value of like 0.03. Um, what about the uh, association between instructor gender and final exam scores? Negative in every case. So the students of female instructors did better, on average, in all of these disciplines. So again, we're, this is a way to try to control for teaching effectiveness. And what we're seeing is men get higher ratings, women are more effective. <clears throat> um, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. It turns out that students' great expectations are a very strong predictor of the evaluation scores they're going to get. Positive association between the grade they expect and the score that they give the, the instructor across the board, um, and statistically significant across the board. Okay, um, so I'm going to just jump over this and go go on. Uh, so what are we what are we measuring here for the McNell et al. data? It basically controls for everything except the name because it compares the instructor to himself or to herself, just using it using a different name. French data control for discipline, uh, year teaching effectiveness. And we see that there are differences across disciplines in the strengths of these associations, which again, lends credence to the notion that it's gonna be hard. You, you can't do what was proposed in the Fox News things of, of making a uniform uh, shift to everybody's score. Um, I'm gonna skip over that, but I am gonna do one little punchline since this is information theory and people probably do some simulations and maybe even do some of those simulations in R. Um, it turns out that R's way of generating random integers and random samples uh, is broken. Um, uh, so in particular, what it does is a method that involves um, rounding things. Um, so you're starting with some underlying distribution that's discrete and then uh, multiplying by a big number and rounding. And the number of points of support that you catch when you do that can vary 
between neighboring integers. And so you end up getting a different probability of selection of different integers. Uh, this would work fine if u were a continuous uniformly distributed random number, but it doesn't work well when u has actually got some discreteness under the hood. And here's a little uh, simulation to show that there's a non-small effect. Um, so those who don't read uh, uh, R, um, this is uh, two-fifths of two to the 32nd. Uh, let's take uh, a random sample of size a million uh, from the integers one to M um, with replacement, and then let's plot that uh, mod two. So we're getting even and odd numbers. And it turns out that you get even numbers about 40% of the time and odd numbers about 60% of the time. Right, this is a non-small. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so um, there are people on both sides of this argument. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, the strongest voices advocating for reliance on student evaluations for things like this are people who make a living selling student evaluations. Um, Benton and Cashin work for a company called IDEA that markets evaluations uh, to universities. Um, it's widely cited. Uh, it's a tech report. I'm not mentioning that because I believe that tech reports can't have good work. I'm mentioning that uh, for a reason that I'll, 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 I'll come back to in a second. Um, they claim that student evaluations are reliable and valid. Um, they don't cite either of the controlled randomized experiments that happened before they issued this report. Um, it's kind of telling them what they, what they omitted. Um, they didn't support, they didn't cite anything that used randomization that I could, as far as I could tell. Um, they do say that theoretically the best indicator of effective teaching is student learning. Other things being equal, the students are more effective teachers should learn more. I completely agree. Um, it's just that I don't think we can measure that. Um, and, and we'll talk about what we might actually be able to measure. So uh, uh, just to close the loop on that story, I decided to publish the two papers I've written on this in a journal called Science Open, which is uh, it's, a, it's a fully open journal that has post-publication, non-anonymous peer review. Um, and one reason for this was just to check out that mode of scholarly communication. Another reason is I didn't want it behind a paywall. And I kind of, I, I'm on their editorial board, I just kind of wanted to see how this worked. Um, and uh, they do a quick check for plagiarism and obvious problems before posting it, but then they try to solicit um, uh, referees reports. So we got two reviews of this uh, paper, one of which was strong and positive, and the other one was kind of lukewarm, and it was from somebody who works for, for IDEA, um, the company that sells student evaluations. So it was neat to be able to see who that was. Um, and one of the things they criticized it for was that it wasn't peer reviewed, which was kind of hilarious given that the you know, most widely cited study in, in support of this stuff is their own non peer reviewed. Anyway. <coughs> uh, okay. So um, what do we want to know, right? Um, th there are a lot of studies that say there's no gender problem because look, men's scores on average are comparable to women's scores on average. And that's just not asking the right question, right? The question isn't, can women do something to get high scores? The question is, but for the gender bit, if you flip the gender bit, I'm doing binary gender here, excuse me, um, you know, what would their scores have been, right? Um, and so what you want to do is, is, is control for teaching effectiveness, control for effort, and so on. So Anne Boring found that um, what women need to do to increase their scores is more expensive of time and effort than what men need to do to increase their scores. Men can get higher scores by being more charismatic in class, better command of the classroom. Women have to create better teaching materials, spend more time interacting with students, um, all, all kinds of other things that just take time away from your research and, and, and other stuff. Uh, so it isn't that women can't get high scores, it's that there's a, there's a cost. <clears throat> um, all right, so uh, this was kind of funny. Um, there's a claim uh, based on data from ratemyprofessors.com that once you control for chili peppers, there's no gender effect left. Um, so, ratemyprofessors.com is an any what, uh, what's the, uh, chili the chili peppers, peppers are a measure of how hot the instructors oh, right. are. So I think they might have taken them off. But originally, ratemyprofessors.com, in addition to rating the teachers you, 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 on, on their teaching, you can give them from zero to five chili peppers, right, um, based on their hotness. <clears throat> uh, so, 
I was going to give a talk at Simon Fraser on this stuff, and there was some uh, social media buzz around it, and somebody started tweeting at me saying, you're an idiot, it's not gender, it's hotness, here's the paper to prove it. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, you know, that's not a random sample, it's not a census, it's not an anything, we don't even know the genders of the students who are responding to this stuff, and whereas we actually have experiments done on a hundred, so the, the, the next tweet back was like, I can see why you're against this. Your ratings on Rate My Professor are no good. He didn't say he didn't say So I went and looked on Rate My Professor, which I hadn't looked at in you know 12 years or something like that. And it turns out that there's, I don't know, 30 or 40 ratings of me on ratemyprofessor.com that are not entirely favorable. Most of them are formed from a, a, about a decade ago. During the time that I've accumulated these 40 evaluations on Rate My Professor, I have probably taught in excess of 60,000 students, right? I've taught a MOOC to 52,000 students, I've taught thousands of students in face-to-face -face classes at Berkeley, I've taught, I've taught you know, thousands of students in online classes, I mean, it's just, you know, so, okay. Um, all right, so there are other biases that matter, as I mentioned before, ethnicity and race, age, perceived attractiveness, accents, and then there's a halo effect where if students like you for one thing or dislike you for one thing, it bleeds over. Mm -hmm. uh, airlines get far more complaints about the service when they're delayed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just not good. All right, so there's a strong association between student evaluations and students' grade expectations, as we mentioned. There's a correlation with enjoyment. When I was department chair, I added an item to the student evaluations asking on a scale of one to seven, how much did you enjoy the class? The correlation between that across 1,500 students and instructor effectiveness was 0.75, and uh, between uh, course effectiveness, 0.8. And these are very big correlation coefficients for data sets that size, right? So, um, okay, uh, gender, ethnicity, age, et cetera. Okay, uh, what should we do? Um, I think that what we should do is uh, give up the pretense that we can actually measure effectiveness. We can't really measure outputs, but we can measure inputs. We can measure, to some extent, how much time and energy is the instructor putting in to teaching, to advising undergrads, to revising the curriculum, to building new courses, to making nice course materials. You know, all of these things that, that we think should lead to learning, right, or at least you know, create circumstances conducive to learning, um, and that that's really the way to go. Um, and so things like teaching portfolios where faculty can, can say, here's my syllabus, here's examples of student work, um, uh, you know, and, and so on, I think are, are a much better way to do it. I think periodic peer observation is a really good idea, although it is somewhat expensive. I can talk about that a bit. So <clears throat> um, principles for student evaluation items. You want to ask your questions about the student's subjective experience of the course. You, you, as we noted, you can't even ask them if the homework was returned promptly, right? That's not, right, because promptly is kind of an objective thing and you're not going to get an objective answer. You're going to get something else. But you can say, did you have a good time? Yeah. Um, if you ask that, what you're probably going to get an answer to is, did you have a good time during the last two weeks of the class? Because memories are short, and there's a lot of economic research that suggests that you're not going to get an integrated answer, you're going to get something, uh, something shorter. Um, avoiding uh, abstract questions, omnibus questions like, on the whole, how effective was this? Th those just invite bias, and students aren't really um, qualified to, to judge. These are two items that are being proposed to be added to Berkeley's evaluations. I, I, I may have, I paraphrased them slightly, but um, the, on the whole, the proposals have been good, but these are two kind of howlers. The structure of the course helped me learn. What is the structure of the course? Does that mean lecture versus seminar versus online? Does it mean group assignments? What does it mean? I have no idea. Right? Uh, if the student said no, I, I wouldn't know what to do. Right? This is not going to inform better pedagogy. Okay? This is, the instructor created an inclusive environment consistent with the university's policy on diversity and inclusiveness. <laughs> I mean, I would like to know the answer to that, but I'm not going to get the answer to that by asking students. Right? I, I mean, first of all, they probably have no idea what, what they are. So what is a legitimate question here? Right? I felt included. I felt welcome. Right? That, that's a legitimate question, but this is not, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, things you might want to know. I attended scheduled classes. Lectures helped. Um, I read, I did the readings. <laughs> when did you do the readings? <laughs> uh, you know, things like this. So, th there are examples, other things like, you know, the, the, the lectures helped me understand, you know, the, the, the course material. And, you know, if the answer is no, 
you still need a box to be able to explain there were no lectures, right? This was, a, or, or something like that, right? You know, the, 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 did the textbook help you learn? No, I didn't read it, right? Um, okay, I didn't so it. It, it, you, you, you need a little nuance here, okay. Um, all right, so litigation, I know I should stop here. Um, uh, there's, there's a number of arbitrations and lawsuits that have happened or are continuing to take place in various places that I've, I've been uh, a witness in. Uh, this uh, Newfoundland, this Ontario thing that I pointed out, civil litigation in Ohio, two female faculty suing the business school over salary discrimination, um, uh, civil litigation in Vermont, um, a couple of uh, um, union arbitrations in Florida, there are actually two of these, union grievance in Berkeley, and then there's a number of, faculty, a number of uh, attorneys who want to pursue class actions on behalf of um, uh, women in particular um, who are, um, you know, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, dis disparate impact, right? A, a protected group on which there is disparate impact of using this policy. So I'm hopeful that even if universities aren't gonna do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, they'll do the right thing out of risk mitigation, um, which is a, a stronger lever with the administration sometimes. <clears throat> um, there are universities that have made substantial progress, USC <clears throat> and the University of Oregon and Colorado State. Um, USC is and University of Oregon I think are both eliminating reliance on numerical scores. Um, in in uh, Ontario, Canada, they're, they're, they're eliminating reliance on, on the averages. Um, USC is trying to take a much more holistic approach. Colorado State has revised their, uh, their items and so forth. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll shut up. There's a bunch of references and this stuff is all uh, on the web if you want it. Here's the URL. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just a couple of quick other data points people might be interested in is, so I, I looked at 10 years of University of Colorado teaching evaluations, mm -hmm. and one of the things I looked at was the correlation between the, you know, they asked overall, but then they asked, you know, 15 other things, all details. If you look at the correlation, it was like 0.9, you know, it was clear the students were not making any discrimination whatsoever. Uh, the other thing was they had a workload rating on that and so what I could see is the as you say there's a but there's a, a correlation with with expect you know what course what grades this course was done for giving the the there was an anti-correlation a factor too larger for what the workload was so interesting that was uh, that's just some other data to throw in that supports all this anyway so on, on the workload issue, um, anecdotally, you know, if you ask students how many hours they spend on a class per week, they spend you know twenty five hours on each of their four courses. Right? It's, um, yeah. uh, so kind of a better question is compared to other courses at this level, was this more work less work? Yeah. That that was actually the thing. Yeah. Yeah, there was, there was an issue about five years ago in the School of Engineering uh, that was really interesting to me. They decided that out of uh, uh, a score from one to five that all lecturers should have at least a four point rating. Yep. Well, it turns out that um, a four point rating was very good, but a three point rating was good. So any student who, who thought the instructor was doing good was actually failing yep. the instructor. Okay. Um, it, this issue of the correlation between the items, for me, um, uh, in this lawsuit, there were, uh, in the student evaluations, there were a number of item, individual items that were supposed to get at the quality of teaching on different uh, axes, and then a, a you know, combined score, um, a separate, you know, so how, how good was the instructor? And if you look at the difference between the average on these things that are supposed to be measuring quality and what the students called the quality, um, there was a gap between them, but the gap, and I think it's a negative gap, they rate, rate the individual things higher than they do the overall thing, but the gap was larger for women than for men. Um, which was also kind of telling. Yeah. Same, again, it's kind of same performance on the axes, yeah. but you're not as good. So, for the schools that have been evaluated, what with student evaluations for ten years, what, what do you, how do they? Uh, so I, I didn't hear the beginning of the question. I'm sorry. For the schools that have done away with student evaluations for ten years, what are they doing? So some of them are doing a combination of uh, peer evaluation and portfolios. I think it is largely it. Um, so peer observation, I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing, right? In, in an R1 university, we want everybody to read our papers, we want everybody to come to our seminars, and we don't want anybody else seeing what we do in class. It's a dirty secret, right? Uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, if we want teaching to get better, 
we ought to be looking at each other's teaching and paying attention to this stuff. We can learn from each other um, and have conversations around it. Um, and so I think anything that kind of brings the attention back to the teaching rather than what students say about the teaching is already an improvement. To the point, though, of potentially having another set of lawsuits, peer, peer feedback on teaching for formative and developmental and let's go have coffee and learn from each other yep. makes a lot of sense. If you're going to try to use it in a summative way, you have to have the kind of inter-rater reliability that most faculty aren't yep. going to have time for or don't want to be in that role. Mm, right. And in the absence of that, it's the next set of lawsuits, I think. I, I completely agree with you. What, what, what you. So we instituted peer observation or milestone uh, reviews in, in my department when I was chair, so that's now eight years ago. Um, and so milestones are mid-career, promotion to tenure, full professor, and then we have these weird step six and above scale things that, that we see. Um, the peer observation is not supposed to be judgment. It is supposed to be observation in the same way. It's saying, I saw this in the classroom, I saw this. Not, this is a wonderful teacher. She teaches just the way I do. Must be a wonderful teacher. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and also what we gave lists of things to look for, but made it clear that it's not a checklist. Right? It's not like, if you didn't flip the classroom, you're not a good teacher, right? Um, I mean, there is not gonna be a single mode of communicating in a classroom that works for all material, or that works for all instructors, or that works for all students. Um, and so I am a little worried that, that you know, some pushes to, to modernize may actually put faculty into a position where they're less competent, um, less effective. Yeah. Um. You know those the, the tables of various work and lots of different figures. Can you comment a bit on how we should read? And so there are, there are a lot of hypotheses, most of which turned out to be insignificant. Can you comment a bit on how we should read the entire picture, knowing that some hypotheses turned out to be very significant and others not so much? So I'm sorry, which which ones? For are all of the tables, the ones you're showing now. Okay, so this one? I don't know, no, like the, the collective effect of like all of the tables was that there were some hypotheses that turned out to be significant and some that did not. And some that did not, yeah. And like, how um, should we read that well, in terms of the overall picture? So here, what we have is, um, you know, a very consistent pattern of negative association, okay. but none of them individually rises to a level of statistical significance. If you combine them on the assumption that these were independent things, which they're not, I mean, there's a way to deal with permutation tests that take into account the correlation structure, then you might think of this as being, you know, we've got one, two, three, four, five things, what's the chance they would all be negative if each was a coin toss, okay. right? So one over two to the fifth, so it's still about a 3% significance level combined. But maybe each individual case just less statistical power to... Yeah, just, there just isn't enough power to, okay. to see what's going on here. So for me, it's the consistency of these that, 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 is, that is telling the story. Um, you know, here again, we're seeing positive associations everywhere they're not all significant, but they, I mean, they, they, are, all, they are all positive. Um, here, uh, I mean, this is, here, the, you know, for me, the story is, look, they're not consistent in sign, right? That, that sort of, the, 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 this, whatever you want to say about student evaluations, they're not a good predictor of how a student is going to do on an anonymously graded, uniformly administered final exam. That if, if the instructors are any good, ought to have some connection to the material the students are supposed to learn. Um, so that, yeah, the lack of significance here is kind of part of the story. <clears throat> I, I would expect these these different biases, particularly gender bias, to be quite discipline specific, just because we have in, the, in the implicit bias. And so, I mean, I know there have been a couple of studies specifically in physics courses yep. where females there was big differences, male and female. There, uh, and you know, there's some evidence that in disciplines that have more female faculty, or even departments that have more female faculty, the biases aren't as large. Um, it's just sort of, it, it's sort of um, yeah. Uh, what about what about you know fields where where society seen, sees them as more you know something more appropriate for females versus more appropriate for males? I, I, I think that may be linked to which departments have them. Yeah, to some extent. Uh, I, I should mention that there is an interaction between student gender and, instru and instructor gender, and that some of the gender <laughs> differences that we saw, I can't remember which one goes which way, but in, in, in either the US data or the French data, it's women who are rating female instructors lower, and in the other, it's men who are rating female instructors lower. 
Um, I think in the physics cases, I think about it's about the same actually. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for coming.